take a seat, please? Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's Board of Appeals hearing. Before we begin, let me introduce some members of town government that act as advisors to this board. To my left is Paul Hennings, counsel to the board. To his left is David Flynn, assistant planning director. Now let me tell you why you're here tonight. New York State statute requires that any town that adopts zoning must also have a board of appeals to act as a re relief valve so that those persons agreed by strict application of zoning ordinance can seek relief without the expense of going to court. Town board can give board of appeals additional powers such as special exception approval, site plan approval. In Smithtown, the town board has given this board authority regarding certificate of existing use and some special exception uses. The most common kind of application before the board, board is our area variances. Area variances deal with dimension as lot area, frontage, height, setbacks, and parking spaces. New York State statute mandates that the board must consider the following five criteria in area variances. When you come to the podium to present your application, you will need to address these five areas. They're posted here for you. Number one, whether an undesirable change will be produced in the character neighborhood <coughs> or a detriment to nearby properties will be created. <coughs> Number two, whether the applicant has other feasible alternatives. Number three, whether the variance is substantial. Number four, whether an adverse impact on the environment will be created. And number five, whether the alleged difficulty is self-created. <clears throat> the statute requires the board to balance the interests of the applicant and those of, and those of the neighborhood or community. This statute further requires that the board shall grant the minimum variance and shall deem necessary and adequate, and at the same time, preserve and protect the character of the neighborhood and the health, safety, and welfare of the community. The board has the power to impose reasonable con uh, <coughs> conditions for granting variances. Special exceptions applications are different than area variances when you have a special exception application. Before us, I'll explain the different criteria. Regarding procedure, cases will be called in, in order that they are advertised. When your case is called, please come forward, submit your affidavits and mailing receipts to Mr. Flynn, and you will be sworn in at the podium and we will be given the opportunity to explain to this board why you need the variance. After the applicant is done speaking, all interested parties will be given one opportunity and only one opportunity to be heard. So please, organize your thoughts, keep your remarks factual that are related to the case. Then I will ask the applicant to come back to the podium and answer your concerns. The board will then close the case and reserve decision. After all the hearings are clo closed, the board will review the cases and decide some of them. Others will be reviewed at a later date. There are three ways to find out the results of the case. Number one, you can work, wait until after the public hearing, but there's no guarantee that the board will act on your case tonight. Number two, you can call the planning department tomorrow afternoon. And number three, applicants can wait and be notified by mail. We do have one adjournment. Case 17062, Tristan Latugia. That is one on uh, 29 Dillmont Drive. Are there anyone interested in that case? Okay. That has been adjourned to February 25th. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, please. Madam Chairman, the first case t tonight is 17,058, Richard Van Austin, 91 Fulton Boulevard, Tomac, New York. 
location, north side of Fulton Boulevard, 978 feet west of Washington Boulevard, property zoned R21. The request, a variance to increase maximum front yard paving from 25 to 41 percent. indicated to the uh, the council, this is the first time it's ever happened to me. We filed our certified oh. mailing. Uh, they stamped a little green ticket. Um, we did two other cases that same that same night, and um, um, or that same mailing. And in this case, uh, it just never was mailed. I spoke to. Uh, I gave David uh, a copy of the uh, person's name, Eric Meyer, and uh, he was supposed to call me back today from the post office and investigate what happened. So far, they, they haven't. The only thing I can say is we did everything we could have done uh, with respect to the mailing, and uh, for whatever reason, not one piece of mail in this case was ever delivered. Um, to the uh, to the people in the uh, within the 200 foot radius, but it was advertised in the newspaper and it was posted. Yes. Okay. Uh, this matter, uh, as you can see uh, from the uh, application and from a little diagram that we submitted uh, to the board, is to uh, increase the maximum uh, coverage of paved area. Uh, in the front yard from 25 percent to 41 percent. Uh, from the pictures, you'll see that um, um, it's um, a driveway uh, along with, well, the pictures you see show the stone for the eventual asphalt, which was uh, put down before the winter uh, set in. Um, uh, from the diagram, um, uh, you can see that it's it, it is 41 percent. It really is an overpowering um, uh, to the um, uh, to the house. It's a rather large lot, and it's on a curve. You can see uh, the curving of Fulton Boulevard, uh, where the um, where the uh, uh, the pink area is, which denotes all the impervious services. Uh, we don't think that this would have an adverse effect on the character of the area. Um, can it be achieved by some other method? Yeah, I guess we could uh, trim it down a little bit, but it really doesn't have any overbearing effect on the neighborhood. Um, is the uh, variance substantial? Um, we don't think so. If you look at the whole neighborhood and the type of, uh, the size of all of the lots, the lot is a very deep lot. Um, so that um, in, in viewing the, the entire uh, picture of uh, the house and the houses alongside of them, um, it doesn't have any uh, uh, adverse effect and, and it really doesn't look substantial. Uh, whether the proposed variance will have an adverse effect on the environment, um, no, it will not. And uh, whether was the difficulty self-created? Well, my client uh, did hire a contractor and uh, as most times with this type of a situation, uh, it happens that um, the client doesn't know and nor, nor does the subcontractor know or contractor uh, that there are requirements of uh, a maximum paving in the front yard and even the side yards uh, of, uh, uh, in the town of Smithtown. So we ask the board for its favorable consideration. I have my client here if you have any questions. Okay. Planning? Um, Madam Chair, the Planning Department would just recommend that the board grant the minimum relief necessary in order to protect uh, the town from flooding and future residents from having contaminated groundwater. Gentlemen. No, no. 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 Thank you so much. Is there anyone here that would like to be heard on this application? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to close the hearing. So moved. Second. Ready, moved, and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries.
The next case is 17,059, Charles and Irene Roback, 27 Wenmore Road, Comac, New York. Location, east side of Wenmore Road, 205 feet south of Bethany Drive, property zoned R10. The request is a variance to reduce the minimum rear yard setback from 50 to 47 feet for an existing 216 square foot deck. Uh, let me have the applicant first, please. May I have your name and address, please? Charles J. Roback. And your address, Charles? The former address it was 27 Wenmore Road, Comac. Okay. A resident for 51 years. Okay. Raise your right hand, please. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Would you like this gentleman to speak for you? Uh, he is the gentleman. Mike, that bought my house. I already have moved out to a okay. uh, co-op. All right, let and me he's, get... he's the one that uh, bought the unit that I had. Uh, did you want to speak at all? Um, no? That's right. You don't sure, have we can trade off. Well, if you're going to speak, I need to swear you. <coughs> sure. So you want to... You have to give me... Go to the mic, please. Okay. Let me have your name and spell your last name. Michael Buffalino. It's B-U-F-F-A-L-I-N-O. And you're at this address, 27? Correct, 27 Wenmore Road. Okay. You swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I do. I, thank you. All right. You want to start off and just explain? Yes, I uh, have a deck that was built approximately 25 years ago. A gentleman next door had some work done on his property, so I asked him to come over and do a deck for me. And the deck it was approximately 10 by 20, and I think one part of the deck was 12 feet. And I, here there's a discrepancy that I didn't really know. I thought the contractor would know this uh, about you're supposed to be 50 feet in your property line, and we're 47 feet. So there's a discrepancy on that end of it. And uh, that's the situation right now that we have. Okay. Planning? No comments, thank you. Gentlemen. No, no. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Is there anyone here that would like to be heard on this application? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to close the hearing. So moved. Second. It's regularly moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. You're welcome. The next case is 17,060. Lillian Katz, 11 Wesleyan Drive, Comac, New York. The location, the north side of Wesleyan Drive, I'm sorry, Wesleyan Road. 336 feet east of Kings Park Road, property zoned R10, variance to reduce the minimum rear yard setback from 50 feet to 38 feet for an existing 288 square foot deck. Okay. You can take that mic out. Thank you. All right. All right. Can I have your name, please? Lillian Katz. And your address, Lillian? 11 Wesleyan Road, Comac. Okay, raise your right hand. Can you do that? Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Help me God. Would you like the settlement now to speak for you? Okay, all right. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chairperson, members of the board. Uh, reference to this deck, I you guess you guys- You need to give me your name and address. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought you knew that by now. <laughs> I know, but... <laughs> uh, name's Andreas Sophocles, S-O-F-O-K-L-I-S, address 49 Blossom Avenue, Holtzville, New York, 11742. All right, do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. Okay. So, the request is for a rear yard variant setback for a deck. Um, really, the issue is the height is a little bit higher, otherwise it would be conforming. I think it's about six or eight inches higher than it's supposed to be. Um, the request is for a rear yard setback. It's a residential deck customarily found in the area. The request is for a rear yard setback, and the property that abuts the rear yard is actually a public school, not even a residential uh, property. Typically, the deck is used with, by this party animal here on the weekends, and that's an unoccupied building at that time. So we don't feel that the uh, request is substantial. Um, the deck has been there for 
t over 20 years, hasn't concerned any uh, neighboring properties or caused any devaluation to neighboring properties. So we don't feel that that is an issue as well. Um, the variance could not be achieved by any other means, basically because of the fact that the deck is existing and the setup of the deck, it would be a severe hardship to modify it because it's a triple level deck there and everything would have to be re-evaluated uh, in order to just make it conform. Um, we don't believe that that is a uh, environmentally sensitive issue because it's a residential deck and in an area with no environmentally sensitive lands around it. The hardship was, however, created by the owners because they were wrongfully under the impression that a permit was not required for a deck um, of that nature. So that's, uh, that's where we're at. <laughs> I believe that answers all the questions. Okay. Lanny? No comments or recommendations, thank you. Gentlemen? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much and have a great evening. Thank you. Is there anyone here that would like to be heard on that uh, on this application? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to close the hearing. So moved. Second. Really moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. The next case is 17,061. Vincent Russell, 36 Deepdale Drive, Comac, New York. The location, the west side of Deepdale Drive, 757 feet south of Redleaf Lane. Property zoned R10. The variance is a request to reduce the minimum front yard setback from 40 feet to 37 feet for, for an existing 85 square foot portico. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chairwoman and May Board. I have your name and address, please? Ralph L. Sasser, L. Sasser Expediting Services, agent for the applicant, Vincent Russell. Do you have a power of attorney? Yes, we do. Oh. oh. Okay. okay. Let me have your name again, please. Uh, Ralph L. Sasser, L. Sasser Expediting Services for the applicant, Vincent Russell. You need the spelling of his last name? E L S A S S E R. Okay. And your address? 11 Cherry Street, Selden, New York, 11784. Okay. You raise your right hand, please. You swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Let me tell you a little bit about this application, uh, Madam Chairwoman. There was, this, poly, this structure is actually not even completed yet. Uh, Mr. Russell uh, was in the midst of having some other construction work done on his home, and the contractor had decided to put this portico up. And it actually, I believe somebody from the town of Smithtown saw it and told him to stop working on it, not realizing because what he built so far is still going to require a variance. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, it's nothing that's out of the norm for the area. Um, it's it's going to look beautiful. I've got a couple of photos of similar ones in the area I'd like to submit to the board. Sure. Uh, you have these labeled where they are? Yes, sir. Okay. And I'll pass these down. Perfect. Okay. You want to pass these down? I'll pass them back. And the fact that we're looking for a three feet, we don't feel as substantial. Uh, but, you know, he was definitely um, stopped working on it until we can get the approval for the board, not real, realizing where it was at this point. Uh, the dif difficulty definitely was self-created, uh, but it's not something that is uh, detrimental to the area. Do you know if these uh, porticos uh, have a variance that you handed? Madam Chairwoman, I'm not sure. I okay. couldn't tell you if, in fact, they were granted. Uh, but those are definitely similar structures that are in the area, um, and they're going to look similar, very similar to this one here, if, if the board agrees and is completed. Okay. Thank you. Planning? No comments. Thank you. Gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful Thank evening. Thank you. Thank you. So you. Much. Is there anyone here that would like to be heard on this application? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to close the hearing. So moved. Second. And regularly moved and second. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. The next case is 17,063. Patrick and Tina Byrne, 11 Cliftwood Place, Kings Park, New York. Location, the north side of Cliftwood Place, 454 feet west of Bristol Lane, Kings Park. Property zoned R10. 
the request is a variance to reduce the minimum distance to any lot line from six feet to two feet for an existing 309 square foot shed. Hello. May I have your name, please? Tina Byrne. And your address, Tina? 11 Cliftwood Place, Kings Park. Okay. Raise your right hand, please. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Um, we are looking for, <coughs> excuse me, a variance to um, leave an existing part of a shed, 10 feet of an existing shed. Um, thank you. Uh, two feet from the lot line as opposed to six feet from the lot line. Uh, the reason for not moving that part of the shed based on a previous variance was because the area within this um, storage space actually is a pump room for a pool. And so in having to move, if we were to move that um, 10 foot area back two feet, uh, to, uh, I'm sorry, four feet to from the lot line, then it would, that would require us to then pull up the entire pumping system for the pool and all the lines that go to the pool, which actually is under um, paving and concrete at this time. This was self-created. Uh, it was not intentional, however. It was something that um, took place during the construction of a pool, which had an open permit at the time. So we knew the town was coming in to, um, to approve that permit. It um, character characteristically doesn't look out of place in the neighborhood, the uh, neighbors directly um, next to the shed area have actually written a letter to the town previously stating that they like it. Um, it decreases the noise of pumps. We live in quarter square foot, uh, quarter uh, acre plots, and everyone around us has a pool. You can hear everyone's pump except for ours. So uh, environmentally, sound-wise, it is a convenience to have that 10-foot area of the shed um, enclosing this pump. Um, I do not believe that this is a substanti substantial request for variance, um, and I do not believe it would have any kind of environmental impact by leaving it there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Lenny? Uh, just for the record, this is similar to a previous application that you partially approved. Um, mm -hmm. My understanding is that they moved part of the shed, I think more than half to comply with the board's decision last time? It's two thirds of the shed have two been thirds. moved. Two thirds, It's a 30 foot structure, 20 feet of it had been moved. The last 10 feet was what surrounds this physical pump area. Okay. So we're asking that we can just leave that. If we do have to move it, it does require taking all the pumping and the plumbing that's underneath the ground out and moved. Sure. The old file is mm -hmm. yeah. was rubber banded to the new one. Okay, okay thanks. Thank you. Gentlemen? Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Is there anyone here that would like to be heard on this application? Right. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to close the hearing. So moved. Second. Regularly moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. The next case is 17,064, Kevin McPadden, 106 Grove Road, Kings Park, New York. The location, the west side of Grove Road, 300 feet south of Woodland Road, Kings Park. Property zoned R10. Request variance to reduce rear yard setback from 35 to 25 feet for a proposed two, uh, 480 square foot second floor addition and an existing 624 square foot first floor addition. Your name, please. Kevin McPadden. And <laughs> M-C-P-A-D-D-E-N. Yeah. And your address, Kevin? 106 Grove Road, Kings Park. Okay. All right, raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. I'll be brief. Uh, this is a family home that's owned by my brothers and sisters and I. It was built in the 50s. It was extended on in the 70s, early 70s. That extension was permitted, uh, built by a licensed contractor and CO'd. Uh, the matter of the rear yard setback for reasons unknown to us was not addressed at that t time. That's on the first matter. Um, it does not uh, encroach on my neighbor's property, nor is it visible to my neighbors to the rear. On the second matter, uh, the style and the layout of this, our, our family home is not conducive to a family gathering, so we're endeavoring to put on a, a family room, second story. Uh, it's going to have an inside stairwell. Uh, there's going to be no plumbing other than the heat. 
Uh, it'll stay within the imprint of the existing house. Uh, there is no additional height change. Uh, it's a very minor impact uh, to the street view, only a couple of windows. Uh, there's no adverse impact to the neighborhood or the environment. Okay. Thank you. Planning? No comments. Thank you. Gentlemen. No question. Thank you so much. Is there anyone here that would like to be heard on this application? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to close the hearing. So moved. Second. Is readily moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. The next case is 17,065. Frank Abate, 8 Windange Boulevard, Smithtown, New York. Location, the west side of Windange Boulevard, 198 feet south of Jericho Turnpike, Smithtown. Property zoned R21. The request is a variance to increase the maximum paving in the side yard from 25 to 35 percent, reduce the minimum setback from any lot line from 8 feet to 2 feet for an existing 96 square foot shed, reduce the minimum side yard from 16 to 6 feet for an existing hot tub, reduce the total side yards from 34 to 30 feet, reduce the minimum setback of a retaining wall from the south property line from the height of the retaining wall to 10 inches, reduce the minimum setback of a retaining wall from the north property line from the height of the retaining wall from 3 feet to 0 feet. Good evening, Madam Chairwoman, members of the board. My name is John Zolo, attorney, 38 Southern Boulevard, Suite 3, Nest Constant, New York. My role this evening is brief. David Higita from AD Design will be making the presentation. I just wanted to um, tell the board, I had represented the Raganese who sold this house and issues came up with respect to structures. The seller, Raganese, and the current owner, Abad, Abadi, agreed to use Mr. Higita's company to file all the applications. So he has authority, and I'm representing to this board that Mr. Higita has authority to make the application on behalf of the current owner as well as the former owner, uh, Helen Raganese. Thank you. Yes, don't say. Okay. Thank you. Right. So let me have your name and address, please. Yes, uh, good evening, Madam Chairman, members of the board. My name is David Higita, H I G U I T A, uh, representing uh, uh, the, the Abati and both the Raganese. My address is. 280 Main Street, Suite 25, Farmingdale, New York. Okay. Raise your right hand, please. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. And help me God. Okay. You want to tell us why you're here, please? Yes. Uh, uh, this evening, I'm here. I'm, I'm presenting this uh, variance before this board uh, in behalf of the Ragonisi and the Abati. Uh, this property was uh, recently uh, um, a transfer of deed. Uh, the Ragonisi left uh, for medical reasons to Florida. When the Abati uh, look on the property, they pretty much look and like everything that it was there. Uh, at the time, they thought that everything was legal. Uh, about 20 to 25 years ago, uh, the Ragonisi hired a contractor to do uh, some improvements on the house. They were under the impression that everything was legal at the time. Um, when the, um, the attorney for the buyer made the uh, research on the town, they found that some of these properties were not legal. So that's when I came to the ASIM, and I basically uh, have both parties together. I asked them uh, what they wanted it to do. The, uh, like I said, the new owners pretty much like everything that was on the property. And they both agreed to present the hearing, uh, looking and seeking the support of this board to maintain the property the way it is with the structure the way they are right now. Is, uh, was it self-created? Uh, yes, of course that it was self-created, but um, uh, mm, it's, it's just something that happens sometimes when you hire the contractor and you are under the impression that everything is being done under uh, the regulations. So I do believe that it's not intentionally, of course. Is it a substantial? Um, I took a look on the uh, adjacent properties and I do not believe that uh, there is any negative impact on the character of the neighbor. I also believe that the property is being well maintained. 
by both owners, the previous and the, and the existing one. And the shell, of course, is only for storage. The half tub is on, something that we all know is just for a little bit of pleasure at night. Uh, the reduce of the setback that is required, I don't think that is substantial either. And I'm basically here, um, if the board has any other question, that will be my case. Okay. We visit the property, so I just wanted to know. We were there yes yesterday. Um, there is a vinyl shed on the property, and it says shed to be removed. Yes, that is the one that is going to That's be removed. That's going to be removed. Yes. Okay. All right. Planning? Um, the only comment we have is similar to the first case where we would urge the board to grant the minimum uh, relief necessary with respect to paving the ground in order to minimize problems with flooding and groundwater pollution. I, I just will have to say that um, this may be a, a little bit of a unique situation. Mm -hmm. We did go up this very steep driveway and I, um, it took us a little bit of time to turn around to get down. So. Mm. Um, I just wanted to put that on the record. Sure. All right. You do need a four by four to get to that house. <laughs> oh. You need a big vehicle to get to that house. I'm yeah, I know. I <laughs> it is steep. Okay. Gentlemen, any questions? No. No. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Was there anyone here that wanted to be heard on this case? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to close the hearing. So moved. Second. Is regularly moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. The next case is 17,066, James Viola, or James Viola, 23 Mayflower Avenue, Smithtown, New York. The location, east side of Mayflower Avenue, 259 feet south of Edgewater Avenue, Smithtown. Property zoned R10. The request is a variance to reduce the front yard setback from 40 to 32 feet, to reduce the side yard setback from 12 to 10 feet, for a proposed 186 square foot second floor addition. May I have your name, please? Sure, it's uh, James Viola, V I O L A, 23 Mayflower Avenue, Smithtown, New York. Right. Raise your right hand. You swear, you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Uh, so basically, I just want to build a front dormer on my house. It's a, the structure is almost there already. I just want to expand it. Uh, I brought photos of my house and a house directly next to me, um, which is also set for a little further up towards the front of the property line. Um, I also brought the plans if you guys want to yeah. take a look at those. You have them, I believe. <coughs> Okay. You can't record? talk without oh, using the mic. <laughs> uh, I think we have them right here. Oh, okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so I don't think it'll impact the neighborhood too much. Um, there's all sorts of different various types of houses, so it's not like I'm building something completely different. Um, the difficulty wasn't self created, I haven't started building yet. Okay. So I want to get everything approved first. Um, and the house was built, I guess, before the zoning was put in place. So I'm just asking for a little leeway on, uh, I guess, going from 40 feet to 32 feet on the front and the 12 on the side brought to 10 feet. How old is this house? Uh, I believe it was built in 1950. Oh, well, there was zoning in 1950. Yeah, I, yeah so I mean, they put, I mean, I don't know who, who put it there? I mean, it was either 1940 or 1950. You know, when I bought the house, they told me 1940. Right. But when I started this project, uh, the town told me it was built in 1950. So I'm not. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not a big. Uh, we're not expanding on the footprint, and we're not going any higher than the peak of the house already. Thank you. Thank you. Planning? No comments. Thank you. Gentlemen. No, no, no. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Have a good night. Is, thank you. Is there anyone here that would like to be heard on this application? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to close the hearing. So moved. Second. Regularly moved and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The next case is 17,067. KVC Holding, LLC. DWC Management, LLC. 168 Town Line Road, Kings Park, New York. The location is the west side of Old Northport Road, 609 feet south of Town Line Road, Kings Park. Property zoned LI. The request, a special exception to permit a trucking station in an LI zoning district. Interpretation as to whether, whether the storage of containers is permitted as a customary accessory use to a trucking station. Interpretation as to whether containers without wheels and commercial registration are commercial vehicles. Use variance to permit outdoor storage in the LI zoning district. Variance to reduce the front yard setback for a six foot fence from 50 feet to zero feet. Reduce the minimum required parking setback to rear and side lot lines from six feet to zero feet. Reduce the minimum parking setback from front property lines from 50 feet to zero feet. Reduce the minimum landscaped area in the front yard from 80% to 0%. Reduce the minimum landscaped area from 18% to 1%. Reduce the front yard setback for outdoor storage from 25 feet to 0 feet. To increase the maximum height of outdoor storage from 6 feet to 24 feet. To permit vehicles to be stacked. Reduce planted buffer adjacent to a residence district from 50 feet to zero feet. Reduce setback between a residence district and, a st and storing large commercial vehicles from 100 feet to 25 feet. Increase the maximum number of commercial vehicles from zero to 600. Okay, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, I can see that this is a uh, high interest to the community. Um, the attorney will present his case, and then I will allow everyone to have one opportunity to be heard. Your remarks must be factual that are related to the variances. As a board, our decisions are based on the five criteria posted before you. It is important that the hearing is fair and orderly. Please, there's no calling out or talking from the audience. Um, Everyone needs to cooperate so the court stenographer can hear and record all the statements. I will ask the applicant to come back to the podium to answer your concerns. And I thank you for your cooperation and orderly manner and professional manner. Mr. Tremarco. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the board. My name is Vincent Tremarco. I represent the applicant. Uh, I have offices at 1038 West Jericho Turnpike, Smithtown, New York. <clears throat> I realize that this is a rather uh, lengthy request, and I'll try and be as brief as I can. Um, I guess the, where we should start is um, the type of zoning uh, that uh, is involved in this particular piece of property, uh, which happens to be uh, light industrial. And light industrial does permit a trucking station. Uh, it has permitted a trucking station since the very beginning uh, of the light industrial uh, section of the code. Now the question is whether storage containers, and I think we all know what type of storage containers we're talking about. It's, they're also called overseas containers. They're made out of metal, steel, and they're fully enclosed. Um, and it's our contention that storage containers is permitted as a customary accessory use to a trucking station. And if you could think for a minute about certain other uses where we allow uh, trucking stations and um, the, uh, uh, the use of certain accessories uh, that are delivered by uh, the trucks. Uh, for example, you have dumpsters. Hundreds and hundreds of dumpsters are delivered uh, by um, sanitation trucks to various sites. Uh, you also have uh, situations uh, where 
they have, um, for example, you have uh, Coca-Cola trucks, and Coca-Cola trucks deliver, uh, obviously, Coca-Cola, um, and there is many times storage of pallets and so forth outside in order to, um, um, to reduce the uh, maximum storage inside uh, a building. Uh, these um, uh, old storage, uh, think about the old storage containers which were used as uh, containers, uh, trailers used as containers. We used to, years ago, and I don't think many um, um, mobile uh, storage companies now use trailers, but in the beginning, there were trailers uh, that were pulled by tractors uh, to different sites, and construction sites mostly, and they were left there and, and, uh, until the job was done. Um, and, and they were used as, you know, part of an accessory uh, to a trucking station. Um, the purpose of a trucking station is not just to say, well, you have trucks, and with these trucks, uh, these trucks do a, do a certain service. In this case, we have um, four or five trucks. Mobile Mini Storage, by the way, is the largest storage company in the world. Um, they're on the stock exchange. They have well over 100 storage facilities in the United States. Now, these storage containers, uh, when they're at the site, um, are empty, and they stay empty. They're not used like uh, many warehouses are used and uh, where uh, articles are stored uh, within the containers at the particular uh, site uh, where the uh, containers are located. They have, like I said, four or five trucks. Those trucks move in and out of the uh, company about four to six times a day. Those containers are taken to uh, different properties, whether they be homes or businesses uh, or construction sites. They're used for a time, they're picked up, and they're brought back. There are, um, um, as, I, as I said, four or five trucks at the most. There is um, a requirement, if you look at the definition, and I, I looked at the planning advisory report, uh, and they talk about um, uh, commercial vehicles having registration. But they're really, I mean, if you think about uh, accessories uh, to trucks, um, why not have an accessory as a, um, a storage unit that can be taken to uh, a site and used for storage? Um, there are probably 10 to 15 very large um, uh, mobile storage companies uh, within New York State, and they are successful because there's a need. Now, the problem that we have in, in Smithtown is trying to push these things into categories. Um, as the planning advisory report said, well, there really isn't a category uh, for um, these storage containers, and maybe there should be. But members of the board, we, we can't wait. Uh, I have a client that's either going to be in Smithtown, um, and if this board so decides that they don't see uh, this as being a use that's permitted um, as a trucking station accessory, then they're going to move out of Smithtown. I don't mean it as a threat, but it's a, it's a possibility. It's not a possibility. It's going to happen because they need a place to store these containers as part of their sole use, which is to deliver containers to various sites. This is not something... Um, that can be put anywhere else. This is the best site that, we've ha that we have uh, looked at. I mean, the, the property um, is in a commercial area. There's um, outside storage all around. Whether that storage is legal or not, whether it's a non, they're non-conforming uses or not, 
Um, there's nothing in that area. Old North Fort Road um, uh, has, I don't think there's a facility on Old North Fort Road and in the general area that doesn't have outside storage. They all do. And they couldn't survive without outside storage. The owners of that property, of those properties, including uh, my client, could not survive without outside storage. Now, um, the, um, the, uh, the trucks, think of another thing. When I was thinking about this, there are trucks that accept different body types. You can buy a truck today that is a dump truck, that truck, that body comes off, and you have um, a box body on top of the truck, or a flatbed truck. This is, this is really no different, um, except for the fact that their sole business is to move containers from one place to another. Um, we should also think about the use itself. It's probably the most benign use that anybody could have um, in a um, commercial area. They store the boxes there, they take them off the site, and they bring them back. As, again, there is no storage within uh, uh, those boxes, and the only storage goes on outside of the property at the uh, location where the, um, uh, the, uh, the overseas container is, is brought uh, to the site. Again, if, and I know you visited the site, if you look at all around, there isn't a property that doesn't have outside storage. And I think one of the people that's going to talk tonight um, is going to indicate that without outside storage, you cannot survive uh, in the marketplace. It's just not going to happen. Now, the other part of this whole problem is we have been, uh, a few of my clients uh, have been before the town board uh, informally uh, meeting with the town attorneys and, and assistant town attorneys to try and come up with an ordinance uh, that would be um, commensurate with light industry but with uh, outside storage. We've been doing this, I think, for five or six years now, and we haven't been able, um, for whatever reason, uh, to get to a point where um, the, um, the town board, um, ourselves, and many of the civic associations uh, can come to some sort of agreement uh, that would be beneficial to the people uh, that live around that area, the residential uh, people, to the people that own all of these properties, that for better than a hundred years, it's been outside storage, a rough type of business. Every town has to have uh, an area where um, there is uh, at least some sort of heavy type industry, and maybe it is light industry with outside storage, but we just haven't put our finger on uh, the way to get that done. Now, with respect to this particular app application, we don't have that time. Um, Mobile Mini is going to either be in the town of Smithtown or move somewhere out east where they don't have the same type of uh, restrictions uh, that we have uh, in the town of Smithtown. I'm sorry? Excuse me. Uh, you don't talk to the audience, please. Do not speak from the audience, please. Okay. Now, with respect to the setbacks, we realize that the set setbacks are severe. Uh, the requests are severe, excuse me. Uh, for example, the variance for the six-foot fence uh, from 50 to zero uh, for the side yards, uh, variances uh, for the parking setback variances. But as we said to uh, Civic Association last Thursday night, um, uh, Michael Cox, uh, the main owner of, of the applicants here, 
indicated that he would be willing to uh, compromise with setbacks. And he stated, and I'll state now, that those fences, he followed the same fence line when he built new fences that was there for 70 or 80 years. In that area, there is really no thought about setting back fences like you would on Jericho Turnpike and, and so forth. And maybe there should be, but this was done, you know, many, many, many years ago. But he did say we would consider uh, working with uh, the planning department in doing uh, reasonable setbacks. He also indicated, and, and we'll say for the record now, that um, uh, we'd be amenable to planting uh, uh, buffer uh, trees and, and, and bushes and the like uh, so that the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the containers are less uh, imposing upon upon the roads. Another thing that we could do to make this uh, palatable uh, to, the, to the residents, and, um, and we want it to be acceptable to the residents, is uh, not stacked three high at the road. Move those, the, the stacking of the, of the three high back into the property a little bit, and, and then sufficiently buffer uh, all the um, uh, all the, uh, uh, the roadway, the road frontage, so that it'll have the least impact on people that are driving by. And bearing in mind, this is all commercial property all the way around, even though there's uh, one part that uh, uh, says that it's residential, it's used, that property is used uh, commercially. Um, so we're willing to do that. Another thing that happened at the... Um, uh, at the, uh, the meeting last Thursday night uh, was some of the people indicated, you know, we really don't get any tax revenue. The town doesn't with respect to um, uh, outside storage. The assessor doesn't look at it like they would look at a building. One of the things Michael Cox indicated um, is that he would be amenable uh, to building a, a building there, uh, approximately uh, 3,500 square feet. I'm not sure of what the tax revenues would be, probably 15 to $20,000 more uh, than what um, that particular parcel is paying. Um, they also, uh, it, we also indicated at the meeting that uh, Cox probably in various LLCs spends over 200,000 a year in uh, real estate taxes, which he's happy to do because he runs his businesses out of uh, those uh, locations. So we really want this thing to happen in the, in the town of Smithtown. The town of Smithtown, if it loses mobile mini storage, well, you say, yeah, so what? But it's a, the biggest company in the world with respect to uh, mobile uh, storage um, units. And it's a good use. Uh, if you talk about the environment, it has no environmental effect that we can think about. Um, it has no adverse effect. They're, they're containers uh, and they're shipped in and out of that particular property. They're usually, and I say especially with Mobile Mini, these containers are well maintained. They don't have rusty, uh, rotted out containers. They wouldn't be in business and as big as they are if they um, had containers uh, that were unsightly. You couldn't bring them on a job site. Uh, another thing that we'd like to, to talk about just for a second is um, right now we're located on Jericho Turnpike, probably um, uh, right across from the Northgate Shopping Center. Um, that use over at, at that site uh, lent itself to a substantial amount of complaints from the people uh, in the area that live right behind it. In this case, the residences are, I know, I'm looking probably 1,500, 2,000 feet away. Um, that particular site, if we're successful here, uh, obviously would be vacated and, um, and Mobile Mini would would uh, move to the new uh, site. 
Another thing that right now uh, the Mobile Mini uh, has four employees that live in the town of Smithtown, pay taxes in the town of Smithtown. They're, uh, um, if this is granted, they're contemplating hiring at least four uh, to five or six more uh, employees um, uh, who will hopefully spend their money in the town of, of Smithtown. Um, Another thing is, where do you buy the fuel? Well, Mobile Mini buys the fuel for its trucks in the town of Smithtown, so that the various uh, service stations um, get the benefit of uh, four or five thousand dollars a month in fuel. So it, it, we think it's a win-win for everybody. We are cognizant of the problems and and the. Uh, the concerns that the residents have. We want to be a good neighbor, um, and we want to do um, what's, what's right, but we also want to run a business uh, that is profitable uh, uh, for uh, 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 Mobile Mini. Uh, so we ask the board um, to favorably consider it our application. We don't believe it would have an adverse effect on the character of the area. In fact, it, like I said, as I said, it is a benign use. You put, tra you put boxes in and you take them out. There's no other work on the premises. There's, uh, um, you know, no rock crushing and, you know, all those kind of things that people are concerned about. It's not an asphalt plant. So we think it's a really uh, great use. Uh, whether it's, uh, the requests are substantial, yes, yeah, some of them are substantial, but these are things that occurred for a hundred years. The fences were where they were and, and outside storage was being done for many, many, many years. Um, uh, was the difficulty self-created? No, we're asking the board um, to think about this and determine that this really is an accessory use uh, to a, a, a trucking station. Um, most towns don't even have trucking station ordinances. You run a business, you have 10 trucks, that's just the way it is. Uh, but we have a trucking station ordinance, so obviously we have to deal with it. Um, as far as um, uh, the question of uh, a use variance, and, and of course that's the most difficult thing uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, to convince a board uh, to grant, but what I can say about that, and I think um, uh, Toby Carlson is going to speak, will indicate that without outside storage, none of those companies could make it. They can't make it uh, without some sort of outside storage. It's not the Hop Hog Industrial Park, and even there, they're looking for some outside storage because they can't keep everything inside. So um, I don't know how come some of those properties are LI, like my clients in this case, and some of them are heavy industry, and how this all evolved. It evolved over many, many years. Um, so again, we asked the board uh, to think favorably on it. I know the special exception has criteria. I don't know if you want me to go through that or not. Or David, you want to go through the special exception criteria? Not really, but I think we must. Okay. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have a question, though, before you start. How many containers are you talking about? I'm sorry? How many containers are you talking about? Initially, I thought about uh, 600 containers, but I, I spoke to, um, uh, uh, to Ryan Citarella, the manager of the local uh, mobile mini. He said between four. Right now they have, I think, 300, between three and 400, maybe 500. Um, I don't know that the question is how many, the question is how do you maintain them and is it gonna be any different for uh, the neighbors if there's 400 or, or, or 200. Okay, you wanna go through this? Okay, sure. Um, I would also state that the planning department prepared a planning advisory report um, 
is it a similar operation to what uh, I guess happens in, in most places where you have a, um, a broad cross section of sizes of containers? It is. It, it's it's the same as the current facility uh, in Comac, where we have sizes that range from 10 foot in length up to 40 feet in length. Can you give me an idea of what the breakdown would be? If you had, to, I'm just trying to figure out what size this is actually going to occupy. Okay. Given the different size, um, how how high you're going to stack, and whether it's two or three, and obviously what the cross section is, what sort of a footprint it's going to require. Okay. Uh, if, if we were to stack approximately 500 containers on site, um, I would venture to say that 60% would consist of 40 foot uh, containers and the remaining 40% 40, 40 would be any 10s, 15s, and 20 foot in length containers. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it? Okay, thank you. That concludes my presentation, thank you. Okay, I know everyone, a lot of people would like to speak, so if you would just do me a favor, please, so that I have to wait for the people from the back, if you would just line up, if you'd like to speak, and then I can uh, let you come to the podium and speak, all right? First person, come, uh, first person coming to speak? Come, please. No, give them to me, please. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, wait for you. And pass these down, please. Good evening. My Good name evening. is Fred Eisenbud, Law Office of Frederick Eisenbud in Comac 6165 Jericho Turnpike. I'm a resident of Smithtown off of uh, Bread and Cheese Hollow Road, and I go by this site once a week on my way to tennis and go through Townline to get to my office every day. Uh, Townline Association was created you know, originally to fight the Kings Park Energy Site, and now they represent people in a whole bunch of surrounding communities, including Kings Park, and they try to address issues which they are concerned about. Uh, I, I'm glad I was here to hear the discussion. It, it's obvious that this is not an easy question for the simple reason that there's a need to have outdoor storage. There's no question about it, and the town apparently is struggling with that. The real issue is, though, whether the decision should be made by this board or, should, or by the town board to change the zoning to address the issue on a broad basis. Because the concern has to be that if you allow nine variances which are requested here, it's clear the use variance is not going to be allowed. They didn't even address it, so I won't address that. It's in my papers. Uh, but the area variance is nine area variances, reducing setbacks to zero in a lot of cases. That's a terrible precedent. And moreover, it's a terrible precedent to have uh, a change from the LI prohibition against outdoor storage through this process. You know, the question was whether or not it's inconsistent with the town comprehensive plan. Well, zoning is part of that comprehensive plan. And uh, 322.7, the intent of the district, says for LI, the regulations set forth in this section or set forth elsewhere in this chapter and applicable to the LI district are intended to provide in appropriate locations office research and development, wholesale and light manufacturing on sites of high aesthetic character with adequate buffering from adjacent re residential neighborhoods. <coughs> and not allowing outdoor storage in those areas is perfectly consistent with that intent. So to say you're going to allow it by granting a special exception is a pretty serious thing to do because Virtually everyone there admittedly has outdoor storage. It's illegal. Anybody in business, a plumber, an electrician who has things that they need to bring to other places are going to need outdoor storage. If you grant this, I can't see how you're going to deny it to anyone else who comes in in the LI district. And that is what really the concern of Townline is, that this be done in an orderly fashion and it should be done through planning and through the town board and not on a variance request, which is going to open the door to everyone in LI to try to legalize their, um, their outdoor use by asking for a special exception uh, permit for a trucking station. Uh, Mr. Trimarco answered one of the questions I had in the papers. 
whether they didn't address whether they're going to have four or more trucks. He says they will, so I suppose they can meet the definition of a trucking station. The second interpretation asking, they're asking for whether a container is a vehicle. Uh, clearly it's not, and I'm not going to address that either. But the accessory use one is certainly one that can give pause. And, and 322.3 says an accessory use is defined to mean a subordinate use, customarily incidental to, and located on the same lot occupied by the main use. There's nothing customarily associated with a trucking station about 600 containers. And I think, to your point, I made the same point in my papers, it's clear that the trucking station here is subordinate to the st outdoor storage and not the other way around. It simply doesn't meet the definition of a subordinate use for the accessory, customary accessory, accessory use. Now, if you disagree and allow this to happen, I don't know how you're going to distinguish everyone else who's in the LI neighborhood who wants to make a similar application. That's my concern. And frankly, I, you know, I, I hear this application. I understand it probably is going to be relatively benign. I don't think it's a great idea to have 20-foot high stacks that people have to, they're going to see it no matter where they are. I don't, they said they're going to have some sort of landscaping. I, I, just because fences are along the road now, I mean, we all see the benefit from the wholesale nursery on the corner of Old Northport Road and town line and the benefits of having a setback. They made that area look beautiful. And so there's an advantage to having a setback so you can landscape, and that shouldn't be reduced to zero. Um, I'm a little bit concerned. I don't know enough about this to say that it's not going to have an impact on drainage on the road because if you have these, all of these containers sitting on this property, what's going to happen when there's heavy rains and rainwater washes up against them? Where is the water going to go? Is it going to accumulate and then rush off onto the road in large quantities that it might not otherwise if all of these containers weren't there blocking things. We just don't know. The site plan that was given to you shows 36 containers, three rows you know, of different size containers, totaling 36. So if they're stacked, that's 108. They don't even begin to show where the rest are going to go, and we don't know. And it seems like that's awfully important, even if you are going to think about granting this application. We, we, I've made arguments in here. I'm not going to go through them. You can read them at your leisure. I don't think this request is consistent with the requirements for a special exception or with the town plan and the way things ought to be done in this town. I wish the town board would finally get to dealing with this issue because they have to. But it shouldn't be done on a case-by-case -case basis because you're going to open the floodgates and that's going to be a planning nightmare. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Anyone else that's speaking? Come up, please. Yes. Okay. Just one minute, please. You have to take a break for a minute. Boxes. Thank you. Now, I'll, I'll go to those requirements for filling station. Um, the site shall be at least 500 feet from any church, school, library, playground, or similar place of public assembly. I believe it is, yes. It shall not be within the local waterfront area. It is not. Or within 1,200 feet of the Nisiquag River or its tributaries. It is not. Sites, uh, the next part is not applicable. It deals with sites in the NB and CB districts. Uh, Lowercase b says the site shall be uh, not less than 20,000 square feet. Well, it's way over that. It's four acres. Okay, thank you. With no less than 150 feet of street frontage on any public road. Has more than 150 feet of street frontage. Thank you. C, oh, no, the C doesn't apply. Um, but D does. A densely planted buffer area at least 50 feet deep shall be maintained adjacent to residents, districts, or uses. Uh, we have indicated that we would uh, plant buffers in areas that the board or the planning department request the zoning and in one, there's one property that's zoned residential, but it's not used for residential purposes. So I don't believe, I mean, uh, uh, that's why we requested the variance uh, with respect to that, but we will buffer it. 
however the board tells us to. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, the next, okay, E applies. Uh, e, Pump Islands shall be at least 25 feet from all property lines and buildings. As far as I know, there'll be no Pump Islands. Okay, thank you. Except as otherwise provided pursuant to another section, 322-82C13, no fuel shall be stored above ground. There is no, st no fuel stored on, on the premises for uh, mobile mini. As I indicated, they go out and fill up their trucks at Thank local you. filling stations. Okay, sorry. Thanks. Um, H, signage shall comply with the dimensional requirements of Article 10 of this chapter. It will. Um, lastly, I think, uh, I, no retail sales over 350 square feet in area are permitted except for the following, fuel, oil, coolant, and similar automotive products, goods from coin-operated machines, provided that the machines are within the building, and three, accessory convenience sales, and if I could just stop. There are no retail sales of any kind there. Okay, because the next two paragraphs go on with details about retail sales. Right. Okay. Madam Chair and Mr. Tremarco, those are all of the requirements. Thank you so much. Okay. Madam May Chairman. May I ask a question or sure. ask the board to sure. ask a question? The outdoor storage that's there today, um, what will happen to that? The outdoor storage that's presently there? Mm -hmm. Right. To the extent that uh, uh, Mobile Mini uh, takes over the premises, that outdoor storage will, will be removed. Okay, thank you. Okay, gentlemen, do you have any questions at this time? I think I have a couple questions. Okay. Um, one, the relief that you're seeking from the residence district. I'm uh, sorry? The relief that they're seeking for uh, setbacks from the residence district. They didn't indicate on the site plan um, or survey where that uh, R43 zone is. Can you explain to me just where that R43 I'm gonna is? Ask, uh, Steve. Uh, I'm going to call Steve Cataldo, who did the site plan. Uh, it's not shown on the site plan. Oh, I know that. That's, that's why I'm Oh, where is it? Do you know where it is, Steve? No. Okay. Maybe Dave could help with that. The... Uh, the residential zoning is on the other side of Old Northport Road at the extreme eastern end of the property, uh, opposite the extreme eastern end of this site. So it will be across the roadway. So how would the buffer apply? Um, one of the requirements apply. One does not because it says required rear yard. A different one does because it doesn't say whether it's front or rear. If they set the um, storage uh, 50 feet from the front property line, they w would be in compliance with respect to that corner, yeah, sort of where your pen is. Yeah. Um, so the, since the road is 50 feet wide and the zoning is on the other side of the road, they would, they would have to uh, basically have a 50-foot buffer in the front. And that that provision doesn't apply to the rest of the frontage, which faces north. That's zoned a lot, uh, heavy industry, I think. Well, I'm not sure. I don't have the map, but it's zoned industrial across the street. Okay. Um, does Mr. Cox own that property across the street? I'm sorry? Does Mr. Cox own that property across the street? I know he owns some, some other properties down there. Um, I'm not sure. I, I have his son here. Hmm? Now, Mr. Tansy, what property are you talking about? All right, you want to swear him? Can uh, I have your name, please? Yeah, Michael Cox, Jr. Okay, and your address, Michael Cox? Uh, 29 <laughs> Aspen Road, Kings Park. Okay, raise your right hand. You swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, now, can you tell us where... I, maybe I can explain it a little yeah. better for me. Uh, I guess on the extreme uh, northeast, the northeast corner, yeah, it's actually the southeast it's a, corner. Basically, at the curve of Old Northport Road. 
um, directly across the street from that piece is some residentially zoned property. Um, I guess the question is, uh, are you guys the owners of that property across the street, which is zoned residential? The answer is no. No. Okay. Uh, thank you. Right. The other, just one other thing, just because I'm, I'm trying to break this thing down to its simplest form possible. This application can't move forward unless we adopt one of two mindsets, one being that whether the storage containers is permitted as a customary accessory use to the trucking station or whether containers without wheels and commercial registrations are commercial vehicles. Is that the basic gist of it? And assuming that we don't come to terms with either one of those, then we would be looking at this as a use variance, which we would have to demonstrate a whole other host of uh, criteria. Um, for me personally, whether containers without wheels and commercial registrations are commercial vehicles, I think poses a whole bunch of problems if we interpreted that as being true, because then essentially we're opening the door for anyone with a container to say, oh, it's just a, it's a commercial vehicle, without a real cogent reason for, for saying it's a commercial vehicle. You can't register it at motor vehicles. You can't drive it down the road without a trailer that's registered. And I'm only speaking for myself. I'm just trying to come to terms with this in my head. Um, so for me, it breaks it down to whether the storage of containers is permitted as a customary accessory use to a trucking station. Uh, is the only one that I can think of being somewhat relevant to this application. Is the storage of the container is going to be the accessory use, or do they become the primary use and the trucking station becomes the accessory use? I guess it's how you look at it. I mean, if, they, if you look at the numbers of trucks compared to the amount of containers, um, uh, it's still a business that you need trucks to transport these containers, no matter how you look at it. If you don't have those trucks, you're never going to uh, transport containers to the various uh, sites where they're being rented. Okay, and I'm not, I'm not asking to be cute. I'm, I'm asking because I can't personally figure it out one way or the other which the use is, which is the primary, what's the accessory. Maybe in, in trying to offer a solution here, because I know Mr. Cox really wants to do the right thing and, and make this a viable site. Has he thought? Of, I mean, I did some quick math and figured out that even if you had 600 full-size containers, which I know Mobile Mini does not because they have a kind of a breakdown of 40-footers, uh, 20-footers, 10-footers. Um, if you had 600 full-size one, it's only 64,000 square feet that you would need to store that. Had he thought about the possibility of maybe building just a steel building and putting them inside? Would be uneconomical to do that. Store the entire um, inventory of um, overseas containers or, or, or at least a majority. One of the, we had heard the application, uh, I want to say four or five years ago, for Mobile Mini in, in Comac. And the biggest complaint that the residents had was noise, which I, I don't think is going to be as big a deal down here because you don't have residences in a, in a real close proximity to this site. However, it could be at some point. You know, if there's, if the, if we're thinking 100 years down the road and that R43 somehow winds up R43, then we've made the problem that we've got to live with down the road. Um, I'd just like to explore every avenue possible. Storage inside a building is not something that, uh, uh, that would be economically feasible. Buffering with uh, uh, trees and shrubs, which are and does have noise attenuation attenuation qualities uh, would be something that we would be uh, more than willing to do around the site. So, okay. Let me ask you, why do you have to stack these containers? Why do I, why, why would you have to stack these containers? If, if you didn't stack them, how much room would you ha need for these containers if you did not stack them? Uh, it, it would be, again, un uneconomical. We do have to stack. What I'm saying is we don't have to stack right at the front of the properties where trucks ride by. But if we couldn't stack, then um, Mobile Mini is going to go elsewhere. And, you know, it's just an economic thing. I mean, you have four acres. It's not large enough to have these containers without stacking? No, it, it is not. I'm sorry? for the rental of the 
of the containers or are they built for are they built for uh, the transportation? How do they build? Is that yeah, right. What do they what, what do they do for their customers? Well, they build based upon uh, the rental of the container for periods of time. Right. So they're in the business of renting containers. Yes. Okay. No, you cannot talk from the audience. I'll, I'll definitely give you time to talk when you'd like to. Yep, you, and then I'll have it answered for you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Tamalka, do you have any more that you want yeah, to? Yeah, I think uh, one of the Cox boys wants to say something. All right, I'll have to swear him in then. Go ahead, come on to the mic. Lift the mic up for you. And let me have your name. <coughs> Hello, I'm Kevin Cox. And your address, Kevin? 154 Oakside Drive, Smithtown, New York. Okay, raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, like, like Mr. Shamarco said the other day, there were a few questions when we went uh, to the meeting on Thursday evening about uh, just different, um, like the bufferings um, closer to the street and further mm -hmm. away from the street, stacking the containers further back. And I just wanted to say that, um, and as far as the fences go as well, uh, those the fences, like Mr. Shamarco said, have been there for upwards of 70 years and when my father purchased the property and um, when he purchased the property and re put the fences in he, they weren't moved they were put back right where they were and uh, he's done in my eyes a great job at keeping his property um, clean and if there were a spot in Smithtown uh, if for me, I'd say the best spot would be where this where this property is, and that's all. Thank I'd you. like to answer any questions if anyone has any. I don't think we do. Okay. Thank you so much, Madam, Madam Chair. Yes. Not a question, but I th I think the planning department. Um, I think it would be helpful for the board anyway, to to get some input, um, and it's a difficult application to make sense of because it's very complicated. Um, t but to try to at least organize um, how to deal with it. I think there are two different issues. One are the legal issues, and the second are my, what might be called planning or design issues. Um, and from a planning standpoint, you know, looking ahead toward the future and trying to avoid problems or to see opportunities and do something in advance so that they work, um, this has good and bad aspects. The good aspect is, is that it would probably clean the property up, that the storage of trailers, provided that they are set back or lower or some combination thereof, would get rid of what's there. The flip side is, is what's there isn't legal. I mean, there's no, there's no approval. It's not in compliance with the zoning. Um, with, pres with respect to providing um, goods and services, because the town is supposed to zone land um, in accordance with long-term needs for goods and services or dwelling or other uh, aspects of town life. Um, there's a need for outdoor storage. I think that's fair to say. The hard part is, is what do you do when the zoning ordinance doesn't allow it? Do they come in for a change of zone to a zone that permits it, such as heavy industry or WSI? Um, do they try to get the town board to amend the zoning ordinance to permit outdoor storage? Or do they come to this board for relief, whether it be a use variance or an interpretation that it's a customary accessory use? And I, I think if you reflect on those options, it'll help sort through a way to come through, to come to a uh, a better decision. Madam Chairman, uh, I'd like to call. Um, go ahead. You might use the mic. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, Toby Carlson, please. May I have your name, please? Toby Carlson. And your address, Toby? 140 Old North Port Road, Kings Park, New York, 11754. Okay. You swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Um, a bit of history. Uh, 
Um, I grew up in, and I'm a Carlson. I grew up in uh, the old Northport Road area. I was raised at work down at uh, 140 Old Northport Road, which is directly across the street from Mike Cox's property. Uh, it's heavy industry. And as Tony's remarks about long-term planning, uh, I understand what he's saying about preventing future problems by placing zone, the wrong zoning categories next to uh, residential district or wrong uses next to residential districts. Uh, the property directly across the street um, is, is four property owners, Haran. Um, he has uh, heavy industrial and residential. Uh, Papalizio has residential, uh, not homestead non-conforming for at least 45 to 50 years. Uh, John and Barbara Clary, Eagle Excavation, they're across the street. Uh, it's, it's the same uh, as far as the uses are concerned. Uh, it's been non-conforming residential for at least 40 to 50 years. I own the lot right next door, uh, which is residential. Uh, and then right next door to that is uh, 13 acres of heavy industrial. The next lots over are um, all light industrial. Uh, the outside storage issue on Old Northport Road has been an issue for uh, well over 40 years. If you uh, study all the aerials from the area, um, it's pretty consistent throughout. That that's where all the sand mining operations were. Uh, the, um, uh, all the industrial uses in town were end up sandwiched down uh, between the Smithtown Municipal Facilities, the Smithtown dumps, and the Huntington uh, dump at the time. Uh, and that's where pretty much everybody landed. Uh, when we originally were moved down from Main Street of Kings Park, uh, we moved our uh, precasting operation uh, that was started at, uh, we invented the cesspool in 1947. And then uh, we were asked to move down, relocate down to Old Northport Road. Um, uh, we moved uh, in the early 60s, uh, between 1967 and 1975. Uh, when we came down, uh, we brought our precast uh, cesspool manufacturing facility, which required huge amounts of outside storage and the vertical stacking of precast uh, drainage rings uh, well up to the height of uh, 40 to 50 feet at the time because we used cranes to organize our inventory uh, at the time. Uh, the property across the street that Mike Cox uh, purchased was owned by Pete Presti. It was a mining operation uh, for the longest, uh, since for 40 years, and then uh, it ended up turning into a recycling operation. And then when Mike Cox bought it, he cleaned the site, he replaced the fences, he did plantings outside, he uh, put slatting in the fences, and he did a beautiful job. He bought our old truck shop building, uh, which is a, across the street next door to me, uh, and he uh, repaved the front entrance, and he did a wonderful job landscaping as well. Uh, what I, can I say uh, about the outside storage issues on Old Northport Road is they've been there for a very long time. Uh, it eventually needs to be addressed in some organized fashion, whether it's by the Board of, uh, the board of uh, Zoning Appeals or uh, the town board. Um, it needs to be resolved whether it's okay or not. Uh, as far as Mike's application, I would agree with a lot of the comments that it would be a lot better than what's there now. Um, so um, that being said, I know uh, from experience that uh, the landowners down there, uh, in general, their businesses rely solely on outside storage. Uh, uh, trucks, trailers, uh, equipment, all of our service industries are on Old Northport Road. Uh, all the places that we get our cesspools or, or our landscapers or our septic guy or a paving contractor, they're on Old Northport Road. I don't know one uh, septic guy or paving guy or uh, sand and gravel guy or, or container company that doesn't need a place to be in our town. Uh, I understand uh, that a lot of people have a lot of concerns over container storage. Uh, will more container storage be permittable in the town? That's one I heard. Uh, well, there's the law of supply and demand, and, and we're not in a port. And I agree that uh, 
we, we won't want to see, you know, 30, 40 acres of containers, but I really don't think that's going to happen. And if so, uh, the town board on their own will could put a moratorium on container storage. Uh, they've done it with cell storage places or antennas. Or so I, I think, um, you know, I appreciate the time to talk to you guys. Uh, I, I don't know how you'll decide, but uh, it's a very important and critical decision. And I know that uh, Mike Cox, personally, I've known him for a lot of years. I know, know him since he moved down the area. And if he says he's going to do something, he does it. He does a very nice job. Thank you. Mr. Savalka, is there anyone else? Uh, no, unless you'd like to talk to uh, uh, Ryan Citarella, the general manager of Mobile Mini Storage, if you have any questions. I don't think we do. Is there anything you want to talk about? I don't think so. Uh, maybe. You want to sing? Yeah, I think so. All right. That's the so one who would be the... the Lisi. Lisi. Uh, Jason Siebel, he's the general general manager. I don't know exactly what his title is, but he came down from uh, Boston. from Boston to okay. uh, witness this mm -hmm. here tonight. Okay. Huh? Okay. Let me get your name and first name and last name. Jason Siebolt. Spell your last name. S E A B O L T. And your address, please. Seventy four twenty South Kyrene Road, Tempe, Arizona. Okay. Raise your right hand, please. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I will. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Tansy has a question for you. Uh, getting back to the storage of the containers.